I want to welcome everyone to another Blackmore Connect, Blackmore Partners, Inc. webinar series. We have these webinars with private equity professionals such as Michael Relly, who's here today, a long um, time partner uh, with Blackmore who we've known since 2007, maybe even earlier. It's a long time with Mike. So he'll be our, our main presenter today. Before we do, I, I want to get into a little bit of background on Blackmore Partners. Blackmore Partners was started in 2005. Our mission has always been to find backable executives. So what is a backable executive? A backable ex and work with them to develop a thesis to go after a niche and then get funding from private equity. Executives um, do not need to put money in the deal, although you have the opportunity to do that, and our executives typically get a salary anywhere from uh, 250000 uh, on the bigger deals that could be as high as a million, up to double and triple that for EBITDA improvement, and 5% equity without putting m uh, money in, because skin in the game is putting the deal together. Now, that's only one way to get into private equity we'll, we'll talk about. But the mission of Blackmore Partners has always been to find backable executives and work with them to monetize their background into a deal and get it funded by private equity. Our service to do that is free, no charge. Uh, why? Uh, because we're paid by private equity to do that, and we get paid on the back end. We also are investors, so if you want to know about our, our investor, our PE site, which is here you are, is there's Blackmore Connects, and Blackmore Partners, Inc., and you can see what we do. You can see our, our team. Um, our partners, our advisors, FAQ, our services, we, we work on platforms, add-ons, talent. Um, you can see our, uh, our portfolio companies that we have purchased with our partners uh, who are executives and private equity. If you want to know about opportunities out there, it, there's an opportunity section. So that is a Blackmore Partners, Inc. There are three groups at Blackmore. Group number one is the Blackmore Partners, Inc., where we put deals together. Blackmore, uh, there's Elaine Eldestein as a partner, uh, Rick Grady, and uh, numerous staff. We have the Blackmore Talent Division. Two people there, partners, Mike Johnson, Xian Chow, eight recruiters, and last year they worked on over 200 C-level positions. Now, Here's the thing to keep in mind. According to statistics, there are about 250,000 C-level positions that are available every year. From what we're being told by private equity firms, less than 10% of the recruiting now is being done outside the partners, the associates, and other folks that uh, manage the portfolios. So if you want to get into private equity, the best chance you have, and we'll talk more about it throughout this presentation is get to know private equity firms that are in your exact niche. So the Blackmore Connects, uh, the Blackmore Talent Group, um, the I often get asked by executives on these webinars, well, how do I get in touch with them? Uh, they'll get in touch with you. The way it works is they're hunters, and whenever they have an opportunity and you're a fit, if you're in our database, and they put you in front of the PE firm, if that PE firm then says, wow, that's uh, in the ballpark, uh, you'll be your hat is thrown into the ring there, and they typically look for ten to twenty executives as part of the funnel. Uh, so they'll reach out to you. Then uh, there is the Blackmore Connects group uh, that produce. It's an educational and conference group, and the best way to look at them as each of you are in various niches and industries on this conference, you all would probably go to certain types of trade shows, industry association meetings. You went there because that is where you would meet if you wanted to do hiring, get hired, if you wanted to meet suppliers. It was an ecosystem. In private equity, one of the, uh, the ecosystems, the biggest ecosystem that private equity goes to 40 conferences a year is ACG. 
However, it's mostly they're there to meet um, uh, bankers, accountants, and lawyers. Uh, typically, there is a, a thousand to three thousand folks at these conferences across the country, and uh, maybe a hundred, maybe two hundred P firms, and the rest are suppliers. So, uh, for an executive, one of the challenges they face when going to those conferences is you're a drop of water in the ocean. If you want a personal at uh, attention, uh, the best thing you do is attend the Blackmore Connects group uh, conferences every eight weeks in Chicago. They're not held anywhere else in the country and never will be. Uh, there are not uh, thousands of people. In fact, we have a maximum executive count of 20 and a maximum count of private equity firms, 20. So in their half, their half day meetings start at uh, uh, noon and you're out by 6.30. However, to get into those conferences, you need to have a meeting with a gentleman named Nathan Collins. Uh, the executives need to be executives who have industry and or niche expertise, a track record of building revenue and EBITDA, in any uh, any cycle, uh, P and L history um, uh, is acceptable as low as 25 million uh, P and L. A verifiable track record and a desire for equity, and you're tired of being just a wage, a wage slave. Okay, that's a key premises of the what kind of executives come to the Blackmore Connects uh, types of conferences. Okay. So let's just, um, I want to do some other housekeeping as we're going on here. And uh, we almost at our maximum of 500 people. Uh, there is a handout section in your control panel. All of the handouts for today's conference are located in your control panel in the hand, handout section. Please make sure you download these before the end of the conference or you will not be able to get them. Okay. Uh, in addition, I've sent some questions out to you in the chat box. It, why are you here? What do you want? What questions would you like to be answered? Please type out your questions for Mike about private equity so that we can get those answered uh, throughout the presentation. Something I want to call your attention to here, for those wanting to get into private equity, which is the majority of you on this call, there are five ways to get into private equity. The We call uh, number one is do a deal. Number two, uh, with a deal thesis, that's your calling card. If you want to get into private equity, sending out a resume uh, such as what is the normal practice for a private company or a public company just gets deleted. These days, private equity firms, uh, if you've been on any of our other webinars, are looking for uh, executives with deals. However, in this environment where prices are so high, uh, doing your own deal thesis which is about a niche where the puck is going, will get you a 15 minute call with private equity. The third way to get in private equity is wait for recruiters to call. As mentioned previously, less than 10% of recruiting is being done by recruiters. Uh, it is a very low probability of passive approach to getting jobs with private equity. They're very hard to find which recruiters specialize in private equity. We happen to have eight of them. But still, once again, they only do calling uh, to you. You cannot present yourself to them. They just don't have the time. They're, they're paid, a uh, majority of them, on success fee backlog. You can hire your own recruiter. Now, this has been a very successful strategy. Uh, our recruiters uh, are hunters for other executives, so you're just hiring a paid salesperson. That price typically is about 15 k a month. Uh, our um, recruiters are backlogged uh, for at least uh, seven, eight months right now. So at this point, they're not available to be hired, but there are excellent recruiters out there 
who can be do your personal marketing and save you a lot of time and get you in front of a lot of private equity. However, if you're a do-it-yourself person, do the purple squirrel. Take a deal thesis based on your industry expertise knowledge, send it out to 200 PE firms and that are in your space by email, and you can get uh, dozens and dozens of meetings with private equity for 15 minutes. Now, 15 minutes may not seem like a long time to you and I, but think of this. Private equity firms have more money than they do time. So 15 minutes is equivalent to four, hour, four hours of their day. They're very reticent to meet with executives, but doing the purple squirrel strategy, meaning you have a deal thesis, puts you in the 0.01%, and that's the way to do it. Now, I often get asked, well, how do I go about um, finding these uh, P firms that are exact match to my background and industry expertise? Well, you can buy Bloomberg, uh, Bloomberg uh, PE database. It's about uh, 22000 a year. Uh, there, you can go to uh, lots of ACG conferences and, and collect cards and do matchups uh, that way. Uh, probably very expensive and time consuming uh, to get to those 20 to 40 conferences a year. Uh, there's PitchBook. PitchBook uh, pricing uh, for basic is uh, 15000 a year for their database of, of PC, uh, uh, VCs, private equity, family offices. One of the largest, it is the largest database in the world that's maintained by it. Uh, that's 15 to 30,000. Uh, Black uh, Connects um, has just acquired that database and now it's shared with all of its members. So you can do it that way at a much less expensive cost. The other, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the last way to get into private equity is attend AMA, ACG, Blackmore Connects networking events and just uh, shake hands and uh, do your best to do that. So those are the different ways to get into private equity. So in just a moment, I'm going to be introducing to you Mike Morelli. And Mike is a operating partner at Falconhead Capital. Mike's an experienced board member, an executive coach, and has led four Portfolio Company Engagements as a CEO with Riverside Company, Porsheen Cook Capital Management, and Rutledge Capital. Now, Mike has, he is probably the uh, most prolific CEO of private equity that I've ever met. Uh, I've met P, uh, executives who have done two, but never four. And that really is a testament to Mike's keen um, background and success at growing companies. Before Mike got into private equity, he was an executive like you. Mike was a, has been a, a public company president twice at PepsiCo. He's been on the boards and is on the boards of iControl, CP Calco, Axun, and Rita's Isis. Mike is a master's level accredited at uh, both the American College of Corporate Directors and the National Association of Corporate Directors. He is also a Blue Steps advisor and coach on landing board seats and landing in private equity webinars to Blackmore. So let me take you to Mike's page here. Mike. Um, has a page called Faster Landings. And I recommend you go here and take a look at what he is doing with helping executives like you land board seats. Now, board seats are a beautiful thing. You know, four meetings a year, uh, pay ranges from 50000 to uh, 250000 a year. And Mike works with candidates such as you to help get ready and position yourself uh, to do that. And then that ties directly into the Blackmore Connects group because the Blackmore Connects group can assist you in getting the databases, the connections to meet the private equity firms who are going to hire you as a board member if that's what you want to do. Now, um, 
or sea level rolls. So Mike has been a loyal fan of Blackmore Partners, and today he's going to be presenting his landing board seats. And uh, well, he's going to be presenting uh, presenting his presentation called Landing in Private Equity. I mean, we also do his landing board seats. If you want to get a copy of that, uh, you can send me an e email on that. So I'm going to be turning the presentation over to Mike, and um, let's go to Mike and make him the presenter. And uh, Mike, first of all, can you hear me? I've got you loud and clear, Gerald. All right. And w you know what's extraordinary? Mike is here in our office today. And um, after how many years, Mike, that we've been working together on these presentations? Uh, a long time. 10, 12 years, I think, Gerald. Yes. So here we go, Mike. I've just uh, handed it over to you. Very good. There we go. So, <clears throat> Gerald, thanks very much for that uh, warm introduction and the uh, stellar introduction to, to Blackmore Partners. And I have to say that the single biggest thing that Gerald said in those 10 minutes was his comment about being a drop in the water of water in the ocean. You do not want to be a drop of water in the ocean, <laughs> right? If you want to be more substantive than that, probably the single best thing that you could do that I know of would be to align yourself uh, with Blackmar Partners because Gerald's approach is really stellar. He knows the ways to get into private equity. He knows how to work with you on developing a deal thesis to buy a company, and he knows all of the prospective private equity constituents that you would want to talk to. His purple strategy is unique. It gets attention. It's just totally cool. The Blackmore Talent Group connection uh, is the database that you just have to have your resume in. Uh, and all of us in private equity return Gerald's phone calls and his staff's phone calls. And finally, Blackmore Connects, uh, probably the finest education and conference organization that I've come across uh, to help all of you interested in the private equity space. So with that said, Let's dive into our presentation. And I will say that my world, the private equity world, we've got our own speak. We've got our own language, okay? And Blackmore can teach you how to speak our speak, but I'd like to give you just one example of speaking our speak before we get into the rest of the substance today. So if one of you were to say to us, I'm an action-oriented executive with 21 years leadership experience with Fortune 500 Allied Chemical. You probably would be pounding your chest and feeling pretty good about that. I mean, this has happened to me, and I've felt pretty good about that too. But here would be our translation. We would look at that and say, ugh, 21 years? We want to exit this thing in four years, seven years max. Please get this Rip Van Winkle out of my sight. He probably takes 10 years to figure stuff out that Google and Blackmore people can get done in three years. So you've got to be very careful uh, about the way you speak uh, in private equity. Now, in contrast, if you said... I'm a fortune-trained leader that has made a step change in the EBITDA CAGR in every assignment that I have had. If you said that instead, our translation would be, Jesus, this is my guy. Trump, I'm going to make my bonus. Please don't tax carried interest. This is our guy. Big contrast and reaction. Same individual, same resume. All right. We have a boatload of topics to go through today. And, um, Gerald, the uh, uh, slides are available? Yes, Mike. They are, uh, everyone has the slides available to them in the handout section on their control panel for download. All right. Good, good, good. So my suggestion is because we literally have – a boatload, this is drinking from a fire hose, 
is that everybody download the slides uh, and then page through it at your leisure. The only way that this is practical in the confines of the hour is for me to give you a headline uh, on each of the slides and then at your leisure you can go back and, uh, and drink the full content. Have to make sure everybody understands EBITDA as I talk about it on every slide. We all remember this from our first accounting course. I also need to clarify that today Gerald and I are talking about private equity, not VC. Two completely different worlds. Uh, and I am a private equity professional. I do not profess to know uh, the VC space. Having said that, I do have some biases. But the easiest way to think about the difference is VC deals in early stage. It could be an idea. It could be a molecule. It could be a test tube. Uh, it could be a thesis, uh, but zero revenue or pre-revenue, uh, whatever. Private equity deals with companies that at some point in time could point to an LTM, last 12 months, EBITDA trail. They could, at some point in time, they were profitable, and they could point to an LTM EBITDA trail, okay? Last 12 months EBITDA trail. They may be losing money today, but at some, like Chrysler or other companies over the years, but at some point in time, uh, they made money. That's the world that we're talking about today, private equity. All right. Uh, I jokingly say I live in Darien, Connecticut, uh, and I almost feel like there are more real estate brokers in Darien uh, than there are homes uh, to be sold. Uh, and PE kind of feels like it's done a little bit of the same. Having been born in 1977 by Colbert, Kravis, and Roberts when they left Bear Stearns and formed KKR, a year later, 80 of these leveraged buyout firms Today, 2,700 around the world, 1,700 in the U.S. We're going to talk about a way to target these groups. How do we create value? Well, in the olden days, it was piling on a lot of debt, a lot of leverage. You can see that that component has changed and shifted down over time. Multiple arbitrage, this means... I buy a company for six times EBITDA, but I'm going to sell it a few, year, a few years later for seven times. So I've made money just on that multiple. I'll show you an example uh, in the works. Uh, but operational improvement is really uh, how we hope to, uh, to grow the business. Uh, and that's what many people on this phone call today that have P&L experience uh, offer to bring to private equity firms. Now, because I am so biased in favor of PE, I don't mind throwing in our presentation today in the spirit of balance some black eyes. This is my favorite. This was a front page article, Wall Street Journal, A1, talked about the story of Simmons Mattress, bought and sold six times by these private equity groups. Many of them lost money. All of them paid handsome dividends to themselves. Company actually went bankrupt twice, but the embarrassment of this story in the spirit of black eyes and balance is that the market share of Simmons Mattress between 1986 and 2003 was essentially unchanged. No enhancement to shareholder value whatsoever. Terminology. The providers of capital, the people who are giving us money to invest, they are called the limited partners or the LPs. The fund manager is the general partner or GP or the private equity firm. That's essentially me. Why are these people giving us these buckets of money to invest? Well, the returns better be there, and they are. So this chart shows in the dark blue line the return for private equity versus the S&P. S&P didn't do too bad. We did better. Here's venture capital, which I view synonymous with gambling. You know, I often say that the worst thing that can happen 
to a VC firm is to have a success because when they do, they mistakenly conclude that they were smart where the reality was they were just plain lucky. Who are the people giving us these funds to go invest for them? Unlike public perception, public pension funds, very high on the list. Corporate pension funds, my PepsiCo retirement, very high on the list. These are the kinds of people and organizations who are giving us these monies uh, to invest. And here's just a good snapshot. So what does this one tell us? This is a page from one of the publicly uh, published tables, and it says uh, on this particular day, Arizona Public Safety Retirement System invested in NCAP Investment Fund 9 LP. CalPERS went into Court Square Capital. Florida State Board of Administration went into X, Y, and Z. Lots of money being poured uh, into private equity. And the way that we talk about our fund performance, given that there are 1,700, an unconscionable number, one of the ways we try to normalize the data, because you can't compare yourself to 1,700 people, is by way of the vintage year. Now, by vintage year, we mean we compare our performance to other form, other funds that were created at a like point in time. So if you created your fund in a recession when you were buying on the cheap, it's only fair that your comparison would, would be to other funds that were created also in this period of buying on the cheap. Contrast, if you bought at the top of the cycle, you'd want your fund uh, comparison to be the other funds that were created uh, at a peak cycle. So vintage year is one of the ways that we do that. Now, other ways to categorize the 1700, uh, you, could, you could segment by size of firm, the guys that do the gazillion dollar deals, the mid-market deals, uh, the small deals, uh, and there are those that, that specialize in sectors. And I actually think for most people on this call, that would be the most appropriate way to target uh, private equity firms. Firms that deal in the space for which you have a sweet spot. So as a good example here, Castle, North Castle Partners, friends of mine in Greenwich, uh, have a very well-defined mission. And every private equity firm spends a lot of time uh, on their homepage because they don't want you to waste their time uh, and they don't want to waste your time. So North Castle says on their homepage, they're interested in healthy living and aging, right? So what does that mean? They buy companies in aesthetics, personal care, consumer health, fitness, recreation, home and leisure, nutrition. So if you've got an IT deal, this is not the group you want to take it to. I also coach people to not unnecessarily limit where you could play. As an example, me, right? I get labeled as a consumer guy. That's flattering. I don't mind as soon as people see Pepsi uh, and pizza on my resume. But the fact of the matter is I ran a latex foam manufacturing company. I ran the world's largest industrial burn care company. I ran a tampon business, you know. So don't – under now – I'm not going to go into energy and financial services and healthcare, uh, NIT and materials and resources, but there are a lot of other categories that I could play in. Uh, my point here is don't unnecessarily limit yourself as to where you should play. Now, Mike, I have a question about that because this comes up all the time. When we're uh, yep. working with executives, we say first start off with a deal thesis so you can get uh, a conversation with private equity. If you just present your resume, folks, what's going to happen is they do exactly what Mike talked about. They go, oh, Pepsi guy, okay, he's a consumer. But if you do a deal thesis, which shares your strategic thinking and reasoning, and by the way, uh, I, we attached a deal thesis template 
to the handout section. That will get you a conversation going and they can see you more broadly. But it, what private equity firms are looking for these days more than anything else that I hear, Mike, and I, uh, is, uh, is niche, I, niche ideas where the niche is growing bigger than the overall market. They love that. So that's a way to do it. But Mike, I, I, I got to tell you, I hear over and over from the PE firms is I want industry experts. What, what's the strategies? Uh, here you are at a PE firm. How do you guys overlook that? How do you overlook people who are generalists, thoroughbreds? What's the strategy here? Yeah. So in about the, the first 30 seconds of a conversation with an executive, you could figure out if this is a jockey and you're going to bet on the jockey as opposed to this is a specialist uh, and you're going to bet on his industry expertise. So you've got to come across as a broad-gauged general manager who can transfer skills and learn new industries without being overly optimistic about your ability to transfer industries. Very good question, Gerald. Thank you. All right. So, um, uh, and the other reason for printing out the deck that uh, Gerald uh, pushed out is there's lots of good reference slides uh, in here, uh, some of which we'll just barely touch on today, uh, but you want to have uh, as reference slides. So who are the top fund managers? Well, these are the obvious picks. These are the guys making the front page of the Wall Street Journal. You all know these names. I kind of say to myself, uh, better than this group, and this group is good. It's tremendous. But they do two or three deals a year, and when they do it, they do it big. They buy Chrysler you know, for $13 billion. But the better group to target is the group that's doing many transactions, meaning there's turnover of CEOs. So Riverside Company, as a good example, bought 24 businesses in 2016. That is a boxcar number of businesses, and relative to 24 uh, acquisitions of companies, that meant that probably 50% of the time, 12, uh, they hired new CEOs. Good place to, uh, to surf. All right. These are the four most important slides in the presentation. Here is the essence of the LBO model. You buy a company. It's got $90 million of EBITDA. You value it at seven times multiple, right? You're going to put 270 in cash in, uh, and the rest you're going to raise in debt. You're going to go to GE Capital. Well, not GE any longer, but whoever is your favorite debt provider. Now, in this hypothetical scenario, you're going to sell it five years later. You've improved the business. The EBITDA is now 141 million. Because it's healthier, the next guy is willing to pay you eight times. You paid seven times. Even if the EBITDA were the same, you would make money just on this multiple arbitrage. That's what we meant by multiple arbitrage earlier. Okay? Your proceeds are a million one. You've paid down a little bit of debt. Not a heck of a lot, 360 down to 320. Your proceeds are 810. You uh, cash proceeds. You put 270 in cash in. That is an three times cash on cash return. This is a triple in anybody's book. Now, that's how an individual portfolio company snapshot looks like, ideally. I now want to show you how the total fund snapshot looks like. So Nancy Pelosi, most of us don't realize she has her own private, private equity fund. Uh, I'm obviously uh, making fun here. Started in 2008. She tells the world she's going to do this for 10 years. She's going to buy, build, and sell uh, 10 companies in, in this time period. So what's Nancy done? She bought company A for that amount of money. She bought B for that amount of money, a larger company. She bought C, D, and E. She sold C kind of prematurely probably. But another private equity firm probably said, you know, this is a perfect strategic acquisition for us. We've got to have it. We're going to overpay you. Here's our number. 
And Nancy says, good, good, take it, uh, and great, I'm just going to laugh all the way to the bank. She bought F, smaller company. It may have been a bolt-on for one of these platforms. She sold B. Whoa, looks like for a bath compared to what she paid for it. That happens, black eyes. That's our world. She bought G, sold A. Whoa, really nice gain. Looks like that was comparable to the couple of slides ago where it may have been a 3X for Nancy, cash on cash return. Wow, good for you, Nancy, good going. She bought H, sold D, another nice profit. Whoa, looks like that was about two and a half times what she paid. Good going, Nancy Pelosi. And and it continues. So this is the lifespan of a private equity firm. You're doing some buying. You're doing some building. You're starting to do some selling. And you may still be doing some buy, buying. But the point is, on the bottom of the slide, this is what we refer to as the invest period, where we are doing more of the invest. This is the harvest period, where we're doing more of the sell. Now, where this is relevant to you as a candidate, you get a call from a recruiter asking you to come into the CFO role of XYZ company, which is in our portfolio. One of the questions you want to ask is, where is it in your hold period? If, and the, if the answer is it's in year one or year two, okay, that's pretty good. Plenty of runway left for you and the CEO to, to do your stuff. Make lots of money for shareholders. If they tell you it's in year nine, boy, is that a red flag that they're terminating a CFO just before the end of their hold period? Holy cow, what's going on here? Sounds to me like lots of trouble. How do we make money? When we buy a company and we tap our limited partners on the shoulders for their share uh, of the funds, we then start billing them 2% of those funds that they gave us. That's our management fee. Basically covers salaries and rent, not much more. When we sell a company, our first obligation is to pay back the limited partners, the LPs, a hundred cents on a dollar, we want to get them whole, right? So now they're whole, they haven't made money, but they're whole. What's next left on the table, we take 20%. That's referred to as our carried interest. You know, much talked about uh, in, the, in the press and in tax circles. Uh, and then after we take that 20%, Whatever else is left, and hopefully there's a bundle, goes back to the LPs in proportion to what they paid in. So at the end of the day, how do we measure the results? 1,700 firms in the United States. How do we measure the results? Three measures. Internal rate of return. We all know what that means. Cash on cash return, hold period. IRR, 28 is great. Nothing wrong with 20. I don't know about you, but other than the Trump effect in the last nine months, I've never made 20% of my personal stock market portfolio. Cash on cash return, we showed the, the example earlier uh, of the investment that had a 3X. That's good. 5X, whoa. 2X, nothing wrong with that. Hold period. If you're the LP, LP wouldn't you rather get your cash back sooner rather than later? Three years, that would be kind of really, really cool. So these are the performance measures. Now, let me just show you one slate uh, of buyout fund samples. Oregon State Treasury. Okay, in this table, it shows First of all, they've got a lot of investments in private equity. They're really diversified. How cool are these guys? Oregon State Treasury. They invested in Riverside's, whoops, 
2000 fund. They committed $50 million. So far, they've been tapped on the shoulder to write checks for 46. They've gotten checks back for 73. That sounds like they're probably pretty happy. I mean, they're more than 100 cents on the dollar hole, right? And IRR so far of 22%. Wow, that sounds pretty neat. Well, let's go on the rest of the story. So Riverside comes along three years later, announces their next fund, Riverside Cap Appreciation 2003. Oregon says, you know, I love you guys. I made a lot of money on your last fund. Uh, we're going to up our ante here. We're going to commit $75 million. So far, you've given me back 77. Oh, I take that back. So far, you've tapped me on the shoulders for 77. So there may have been an add on there. Distribution so far of 47. IRR so far of 15. In the eyes of the beholder, Oregon State, which of these two Riverside funds is doing better? The 2000 fund with this IRR of 22 or the 2003 fund with the IRR of 15. Can anybody in our audience guess? We've got 4,000 IQ points uh, on this phone call today. I'll bet there are many guesses. The answer is it is too early to tell. And the reason is, if I can go back a couple of slides, <clears throat> the 2000 fund, the earlier fund, is all the way out here. It's close to the end of its fund cycle. So that IRR that it shows is probably pretty much where it's going to end up. They've only got one or two companies less left in the portfolio. The 2003 fund is well back here. It's three years behind. They're still buying and building. So that IRR may be no reflection of what the ultimate uh, IRR uh, will be. So the answer to that uh, trick audience question is, it's just too early to tell. It really depends on where they are in the whole cycle. All right, moving on in the interest of time. Typical 10 company fund result, some out of the park, some base hits, some singles, and a couple, the bank took the car keys. This happens to us. This would be a typical number for a 10 company portfolio to the bank took the car keys. This happens, but this scares you. You shouldn't be in our business. I love to talk about our workload because all of us work a lot harder than people think. We will look at 300 teasers a year. A teaser is the one or two page summary by the investment banker who's representing the sale. We'll sign a CA and ask to get the books maybe one third of the time. We'll go in and hold management meetings 20 times, write seven letters of intent, do due diligence on our watch and our expense to get one over the finish line. 300 tasers to get one transaction finished. That is a lot of work. And a good private equity firm can get one deal done a year. Now, while we're on the subject, it's important to talk about who we want to meet, right? Because we're busy. We're busy looking at 300 tasers to get one over the finish line. That's a lot of work, okay? Reading a book for me is a four-hour read on an evening, and I do four of these a week. 300 teasers, I'm going to look at 100 books, I'm going to go out and meet with management. That is a boatload of work. So when I talk about people that I want to meet, the best person that I want to meet is what Gerald says, someone who's got a target or a deal thesis. That is the best way to get a PE's attention, right? The last thing in the world, the last thing in the world you want to do in your e-blast is to say, I've got 
48 years experience drilling dry wells, uh, and I know better about dry wells than anybody else uh, in the planet, uh, and I'm just going to fall asleep. You tell me, as Gerald says, you've got a deal or a thesis, you are going to get my attention. This is all, by the way, compliments uh, of Andy Thompson, a good friend of mine at Notch Partners. Comp, I never made what I made as a PepsiCo president. My base was a lot lower in the four engagements I had as a CEO. My bonus was probably about the same. But I could tell you, as a Pepsi president, I sure as heck did not have 5% of PepsiCo stock. The rest of the tabulation here is available uh, in the handout. You will present your deal sheet, okay, which is a one-page synopsis of the transaction if you're looking at a deal. And this particular one, which is a real-world example of a company I tried to buy, Twin Labs, a vitamin nutrition company, excuse me, out on Long Island. And in my pitch to the private equity groups that I took this to, I took it to 10. I said, okay, we're going to do this thing, and it's a little bit risky. We're all going to take some risk with our careers. I am proposing that of the new balance sheet, management has 15 points of the equity, of which five and a half went to yours truly. Three went to the CFO, a terrific person, uh, who would have been the right-hand person in the transaction, and down from there. But 15 points uh, went to management. I want to shift gears a little bit here now and talk about um, temperament of people in private equity. It's a very, very different mindset. It's all about time. I jokingly say that the time frame of a CEO in private equity can sometimes be compared to the half-life of uranium. Start today, gone tomorrow. If you're scared by that, stay out of the space. The better executives who are people who can be jack be quick, jack be fast, be a jack of all trades, you know how to work with scarce resources, no admins, uh, and if a bank meeting is tomorrow and you're the least busy guy in the office at this very second, well, guess what? You, the CEO, are the one who's driving the staples to pick up the binders. What's in the headline these days? Carried interest uh, will always be, still not resolved. Donald Trump, surprisingly, is a fan of taxied, taxing carried interest as ordinary income as opposed to long-term capital gains. I love this story, Staples. Remember this? Through the Romney uh, campaign. Staples returned 5.75x. Wow. For Bain. A 173 IRR. Holy moly. However, three giant post Romney funds would be considered failures. Fund 8 had an 11. Fund 9, a 2.6. Fund ten seven billion dollars. That's a boxcar number. That's more than my visa bill. Actually, lost money. The trades private equity analyst put out by Dow Jones, tremendous publication. Uh, M and A published by ACG. Gerald talked about ACG earlier. I can't emphasize enough the importance of having a LinkedIn profile. Half of our candidates we find from LinkedIn. Uh, and if we don't find you there, if we found you some other way, with 100% odds, we're at least going to take a look at your LinkedIn profile and check you out. So I like to say, if you have an above-average profile, which a lot of people tell me to do, and I also do LinkedIn coaching, you do not exist on the universe. You're one in 2,000 people. You, you literally are, are off anybody's radar screen. You've got to have not just a very good, excellent, or outstanding profile. You've got to be in the top 100 if you're going to be found. 
I call that a killer profile. A killer profile uses these key words as much as possible in the headline, in the summary block. Again, this is a reason why I'd like you to keep this PowerPoint and refer back to it and read it more slowly at your leisure than we're able to accomplish in this precious hour. The prime pieces of real estate are your headline and your summary block. Try to get as many of these words as you can in your headline. Also, I'd like to tell all of Gerald's audience today, be thinking about board roles. It's never too early. Get on one serious, which I mean well-paying board role, by your late 40s. Okay, You should be on two by your mid-50s. Okay? There is a serious project involved to make this happen. It does not happen by accident. If you're sitting back in your early 50s, late 50s, early 60s, thinking that someone's going to call you and put you on, uh, on their board, the odds of that are just about zero. You've got to Mike, go out I have a comment on, on that. You're, you're absolutely yeah. right. The odds are very uh, zero. I get calls uh, and from executives all the time. Hey, uh, can you just get me on a board uh, with private equity? I really want to do it. And, and we say private equity is unprecedentedly, uh, unprecedented amount of hiring is going on right now uh, with for board members. But they're going to people that they have begun to date and gotten to know. So the key thing to keep in mind here, folks, is, as Mike says, get started now because you have to learn how to pitch yourself, learn how to reposition your profile. You have to get personally in front of, of, of uh, PE firms, and, uh, you know, um, that's a key part of the thing. You, the Blackmore Connects, you'll see, uh, there's some webinars up on the Blackmore uh, site talking about how private equity firms are <coughs> excuse me, adding to their bench. And uh, one of the best places they're adding to their bench uh, to put in a plug for the Blackmore Connects division is at events, conferences, ACG, AMAA. They want to meet people, but your calling card if you just go in front of a private equity firm and say, put me on a board, it won't happen. you got to bring something to the table, a deal thesis, an angle is the minimum. Mike, back to you. Yeah. So, Gerald, to reinforce your point, because your audience is obviously interested in private equity, here are the stats. 5,000 public companies. Everybody would like to be on the board uh, of American Express. Okay. Well, I'm not going to try to guess for you what your uh, probabilities are of that happening. In contrast to 5,000 public, there are 16,000 private equity portfolio companies. Everyone has a board, usually with two, sometimes three outside directors, 33,000 board seats, okay? Uh, and your name doesn't need to be Zuckerberg, right? Uh, or Alan Mulally, uh, the former turnaround CEO at Ford, uh, to get on these kinds of boards. This is prime territory for everybody on this call. Uh, I am 66 years old. Uh, I have a full-time day job, as you know. I'm on five boards. I could very easily live very com comfortably on those board fees. Uh, and I hope that that happens to all of you uh, at the right point in time. But you got to start. You got to get going. You got to get serious about getting on these board assignments. I do have a separate coaching practice. This is the website www.fasterlandings.com. I coach CEOs in transition, uh, and I coach senior people who are interested in board roles. Uh, my contact information is on the last slide. If anybody on this call is interested, uh, I'd be happy to, uh, to take your call.
Mike, I want to uh, mention something uh, to the audience here before we get into questions. And as I'm doing this, uh, uh, I've asked that uh, each of you who are in the audience start typing out your questions. We also may go live to you. Uh, but for right now, let's uh, start typing out your questions. Um, Mike has very limited time. Time. Mike is at a private equity firm as an operating partner. I've had uh, Mike. I've had um, you know people have said, "Gosh, you know, I tried to get uh, book time with Mike. Mike is so uh, you know booked up to get any kind of coaching." Mike, do you have kind of a waiting list uh, if uh, if you're unable to schedule with people? Well, I will always take uh, calls, Gerald, and my uh, personal rule is 24 hours, given that I travel a bunch. Yeah. I will always return calls in 24 hours and set up a phone uh, appointment. Uh, I, okay. do, uh, book, I do book clients. I only take two clients at a time. Right. So I can be very, very devoted uh, to the individual, but uh, I, I would be more than willing to take anybody that's in your network uh, and right. take their phone call. Okay. So I, I uh, that's what I've heard. I've heard that uh, definitely you have very limited space on that, but you'll take people's phone calls. Okay, that's great. So let's go ahead and add uh, some questions. Let me start off with one of the questions that came in uh, uh, from Angela, which is about uh, uh, CO roles seem to be missing from uh, PE uh, from the PE uh, port uh, uh, portfolio lineup in Mike's PowerPoint. Does this mean CEOs roles are not typical? Uh, so I'm not sure quite what you mean, Angela. I think you're, if you're talking about being hired, yes, private equity firms, depending on the size definitely upgrade at different periods of time and hire COOs. Uh, in terms of the Blackmore Partners, Inc. side, where we work with backable execs, our fa one of our favorite type of executives is operational folks. Those typically have the COO title, and typically we work with those COOs to, be, uh, to find and buy a company of which they will be the president of. So, uh, Mike, your comments. Yeah, so um, I'm a little surprised that uh, maybe I got misinterpreted there, but the CEO is the most important person in the transaction by far. Riverside, my former private equity firm, will tell you that in 50% of the cases where they buy a company, they need to find a CEO. Uh, it's either because the present founder owner CEO is cashing out and he wants to go to the top of the mountains and do whatever you do at the top of the mountains, uh, or because by mutual agreement, he's not the executive to take it to the next level. So 50% of the time, we have to go find a CEO. Now, once that piece is known, I say that with a question mark, once that piece is known, Riverside will also tell you if they hire a new CEO, in month nine, 50% of those people are still standing, which means it's just a lot of CEO term. Gerald? Yes, sir. I have you on with you here. I have another question for you. Um, what do private equity firms, can you be more specific about the requirements of a um, – board member that PE firms look for. I call it door well, I, openers is what they're, I often yeah. hear in the lower middle market. What do you hear? Yeah. So, Gerald, uh, that question is all over the lot. In some cases, uh, they like to have industry knowledge. Uh, when Falconhead bought Rita's, as a good example, in 1995, uh, their uh, board said, We'd like to add two outside directors, one with uh, industry experience, meaning QSR, quick service restaurant, one with international. Now, I happen to knock off two birds with one stone because I built Pizza Hut's international footprint, as you know, Gerald. Uh, and I also, uh, obviously, you know, had some experience in the industry. So, uh, but 
there were times where they just want to hire. So that's category one. Category two is just hiring good people, people who are agnostic. So of the boards that I'm on, one is a hydrocolloid company, right? Does anybody on this call know what a hydrocolloid is? Well, I could tell you when I got that phone call from Hydric and Struggles, I never heard that word before. So clearly I didn't know what a hydrocolloid was, but I am on their board, and that's because they wanted a good generalist and they appreciated my PepsiCo background. Terrific question, Gerald. Thanks for passing that one through. Great. So here's a question from Richard. Is it too late to start into PE if you are in your 70s, if you were a successful operational turnaround executive? My no, uh, no, answer no, you, no. Yeah. Go ahead, Mike. My, my, my answer is no, 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 no. No, not never. I'm 66. Warren Buffett's 84. You know, I'm going to go at least two, two uh, decades longer than him. So God bless. Keep going. Keep blowing and going. Keep your energy and your testosterone level uh, up and doing your thing. There is no age limit. Uh, this one is from Brian. What's the most attractive way to bring something to the table? For example, deal thesis. Uh, Brian, I need more color on this, but a deal thesis, I gave each one of you a template. Uh, it is part of the Blackmore process. Uh, we have uh, templates, we have examples, and uh, if you want those, you can always send me an email. But the a deal thesis is typically a, a perspective on a niche and within an industry. And uh, there's a format that PP firms like to see that we've solicited and that is our format that we've given to you today. Um, he, uh, here is another question from Joe. If you're coming in as a PECO CEO in the third year to turn, uh, so it's the third year the PE firms has, has owned it, I guess going into its third or fourth year, what are the key questions to ask and requirements to ensure that you get the return in equity and comp? So I would get clear. Well, first of all, I would ask for the model uh, and see what their uh, financial model projected, what kinds of returns, what kind of IRR uh, they expected to achieve uh, when they bought the company. So uh, the, the perfect answer to the question that Gerald just paraphrased, uh, the perfect return question to ask is, how is it performing relative to your model? Is it tracking on the IRR? Is it tracking on the internal return? Uh, the model said you wanted to exit in year seven. Is that still what you're thinking? You know, you want to get a gauge. Is this thing, you know, in good shape or is this thing, you know, in troubled waters? Gerald, yeah. this is an aside. Uh, on the yeah. screen right now, does everybody have the page that I'm looking at, which is by uh, contact I, I off I took it off presenter mode, Mike, so they can't see it. I can go back to you. Right. Can we put this one back up? Okay, yeah. hold on. I will go to attendees and go to Mike and make presenter now. And here you go, Mike. So you'll all have right, to so let me. All right, so I'm back to showing my screen. Yeah. And one more second, and there we are. So if everyone has this now, this is very important because. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of having a stellar, a killer LinkedIn profile. Uh, and I get lots of traction on mine, uh, that board seats and other activities. Uh, but I'm only highlighting this uh, with your uh, clientele today, uh, Gerald, because there are other tips that we simply could not cover in the course of today's seminar. It would be another three-hour session on I'd how agree. to maximize the effect of the yeah. LinkedIn profile. I really encourage people to take a look at mine uh, and feel free to emulate, uh, you know, some of the tricks of the trade that I've used in mine. So please do take it. LinkedIn.com forward slash in forward slash Mike Lorelli. Gerald, back to you. Okay, uh, so one of the things that uh, I want to go back to what uh, Joe was asking. So Joe, and for all executives, if you are, a PE firm is asking you 
interviewing you for a role, you definitely need to know when they bought it. You want to, uh, every PE firm does an investment thesis that they present to the management committee at their firm of why do they want to do this deal, okay? Get that original investment thesis and uh, look over it and look at where, what was their original thinking and where are they now. The other thing is, uh, my, uh, I think the best way to do a deal is do your own deal because you know what's in the, in the pie, so to speak, all the ingredients versus when you take over a company from anyone, an owner, uh, a PE firm. But if you're going to uh, take a role within a PE firm, you definitely need to know how much debt they have on that company, how much underwater the options are, and you need to value those options. It's very easy for them to say, well, we're not going to revalue them, but we know you're a great executive. You're going to turn this company around and bring it above water. Well, you know, in those cases, I tell executives, when you hear that, you better get a much higher salary because your options pool may never be worth anything, and you need to really assess that. Why should you pay for other people's mistakes? Any comment on that, Mike? Well, you never want to pay for anybody else's mistakes, but you're absolutely right, uh, and you have every right as a prospective candidate, uh, employee, uh, owner, et cetera, to ask, uh, how good is the how good is the transaction tracking? So uh, one of the questions came up earlier is how much time and effort does it take to get meetings with private equity firms? Uh, you'll see well, on our Blackmore Connect uh, site uh, uh, under conferences is there is. Uh, a assessment of typically of what level of effort it typically takes if you don't have all the right tools. But basically, four hours a week uh, for six months of emailing your list of 100 plus PEs firms. And by the way, the most executives have an average of only 10 PE firms in their database. We recommend at least 200, and they should be matches to your background. The more there's an alignment of P firms that invest in the niches that you know, the more receptivity, okay? But basically four to six hours uh, uh, for six months, but, and this is typically for executives who don't have a specific uh, list, 20 hours of making calls, 70 hours, 70 plus calls to set up eight in-person meetings, flying time, travel expenses, by the way, when you're meeting with PE firms, don't be surprised if they cancel. The number one goal for a private equity firm is a deal. So if, if you're coming in to meet with them and all of a sudden a deal comes up, a deal call, I'm afraid you will be uh, jilted. It's just the way it is. Don't take it personal. If you don't have a deal and it, this is not a deal meeting, but you're there just to meet with them to either present a thesis or present your background, uh, there are high probabilities of, uh, of meetings being canceled. Also, there's high probabilities of you're just going to get meetings with uh, non-decision makers in the firms, okay? Waiting, lots of waiting for people to show up. Tens of thousands of, of dollars of your precious time, and typically, by the way, in private equity, don't expect for job offers to come right away. It's a dating relationship. So go take a look at this on our Blackmore site. It's one of the benefits of why you want to come to our conferences in person and if you're the right type of executive. You have to talk to Nathan Collins to get qualified. Also, we're in your inbox. On your chat box, there's a special offer. If you're an executive with a P&L north of $25 million, and you're interested in our December 6 workshop, the next two people that email me and I'll forward your name uh, to get qualified by Nathan Collins, the association director. Uh, so we're doing 50% off just for two folks. Typical cost for one conference is 2,000 uh, for each conference. Why is it so expensive? Well, just take a look at how much time that 2,000 um, saves you. Uh, Mike, um, that's it on all the questions. I think we're coming to an end. Anything else in closing? 
Well, I would just say that probably the best single thing people could do would be to name drop Blackmore Partners. Put That's that true. in the subject line of your email. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, your subject line should say Joe Schmaltz uh, hyphen Blackmore Partners because that's a recognized name. All of us get tons of unsolicited emails a day, but all of us in private equity are speaking for myself for sure. Uh, we return Gerald's phone calls because he's a quality contact in our ecosystem, right? Mm -hmm. he, and he only gives us good candidates. So if I get an email and, and in the subject line, the person name drops Blackmore Partners, odds are very high that I'm going to open it. Great. Well, really, thank you for your time, uh, Mike, and look forward to the next 20 to uh, 30 years working with you. Likewise, Daryl. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.